Uh, I am Dr. Devinder Singh, uh, practicing in UK for the past 25 years. And I'm a member of the Homeopathic Medical Association UK as well. Um, thank you, International Homeopathic Forum, for welcoming me to coming on to this panel today. And today's topic is what homeopathy can do, uh, what we need to do in order to make homeopathy number one in the world. So first I would like to discuss uh, why do we need to make homeopathy number one in the world. This is just a preamble. Hmm? So as we know, as a human race, so everyone falls ill at some phase in their life and needs the help of a health practitioner to get better. So Dr. Hahnemann, Dr. Samuel Hahnemann and his successors, we as homeopaths have proved the efficacy of the principle like cures like time and again to restore the health of our patients. Uh, it's only the, a healthy individual uh, which can utilize its full potential to build a progressive society for the betterment of this plan planet. So it's not only the, uh, the planet, but if, if we look at the community level, so a healthy community will uh, give its best for the betterment of everyone around. And similarly, uh, you can extend it as far as is possible, community from the towns, from the cities, and from the states, and from the up, up to uh, the countries, and so on. So only a healthy society on this planet can contribute in every respect for the betterment of this planet and its surroundings. So this is the reason I consider that why should we make homeopathy number one in the world. So, uh, Thank you, doctor. Do you have any other points? Um, yes, yeah, then we can go for the uh, discussion time, the question answer time, then you completed your point. Or? No, 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 uh, no. no, no. So, uh, I've just uh, uh, completed, uh, why do we need to make homeopathy number one in the world? All in, all in. Okay. Yeah? So I'm coming to what needs to be done okay. in order to make homeopathy number one in the world. Okay. Yeah? So that, now I'm going to discuss what needs to be done uh, in order to make homeopathy number one in the world. Uh, can anyone see my, my everyone see my share uh, screen share? No, you can't. No, no, I cannot. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, doesn't matter actually if I continue as it is. Uh, would you like to see my screen or are you yeah, happy? Please. Yeah, please. Oh, all right. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, this was the first slide which I uh, have already discussed. Uh, why do we need to make homeopathy number one in the world? You know, the three points which I've discussed, um, I probably don't need to repeat it. Uh, and now I'm coming to what needs to be done uh, in order to make homeopathy number one in the world. Um, so from my point of view, uh, awareness is very, very important hmm, in order to make homeopathy number one in the world. 
So the first uh, thing is I've seen um, there are um, still people who do not know about what homeopathy is. Hmm? From that point of view, it is important to generate or create awareness uh, about the existence and the efficacy of homeopathy. There are various uh, channels which, which we can use to educate the people at, uh, at large. Uh, we can use the media, we can use the education system. So the media, either it is the, um, the government assisted media, like the, there are many channels uh, which are funded by the uh, state and, and also through the education system. And the, uh, in the education system, uh, it could be primary uh, or secondary education or even at the university level. So if the uh, people, um, students are um, informed about the existence and the efficacy of homeopathy, then they can do something about it or they can use the uh, effectiveness or efficacy what uh, homeopathy imparts uh, when we utilize this system. So the patients who seek medical help should be provided with enough basic information about the various medical systems in order to make a informed choice about the system which they want to use for being treated. So at the moment, I would say uh, that choice doesn't exist. Hmm? The patient, so there are uh, prescribed uh, channels uh, through which the patients uh, seek their medical help. So they will just go and then uh, they will just utilize those, for example, here, so if somebody is ill, so they will, uh, there's a GP surgery uh, or there are uh, nationwide uh, uh, health system, they will use those lines in order to seek medical help. Uh, but if uh, the, uh, at the source, if the patient is uh, given that uh, the basic information about the various system through which a patient's illness can be uh, restored to health, and they should be given the choice and uh, which system they want to be uh, used to be treated. And similarly, the government should also be approached uh, and persuaded to adopt homeopathy in all state funded uh, medical healthcare establishments and the medical education system. For example, the universities are being uh, funded by the state funds. And similarly, the healthcare establishment, the medical center, the hospital, they are also being funded by state. And I'm sure if we can uh, generate enough momentum to approach the government in order to adopt homeopathy as the, uh, if not the mainstream, at least uh, as a bare minimum, as the secondary choice for all uh, patients who need the medical help. Um, that's what I need to say about what needs to be done in order to make homeopathy number one in the world. And the lastly, the future of homeopathy. And if we apply those uh, points which I have highlighted, then the future of homeopathy is bright. And it is not in the interest of homeopaths only, but it is the public or the human race at large. So we are thinking about the, uh, the health of every individual on this planet, rather than a certain section of society or certain countries, etc. So this is universal help, uh, which a homeopath is prepared to provide. <coughs> So that's the end of my presentation. And thank you everyone for listening to me and giving this opportunity to coming on to this panel to uh, express my views. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, How is the situation in UK right now? Um, the solution, uh, solution you mean? 
situation situation in uk right now ah, situation okay situation at the moment uh, if i uh, look 25 years past so there used to be government funded hospital the homeopathic hospital exclusively hmm? so i can see the number of those hospitals being reduced and they are being converted into uh, from exclusively homeopathy to integrated medicine so that means there are they are merging that homeopathy hospital with other disciplines of medicines uh, as well and uh, the patients i don't think they are informed once a patient goes to a doctor uh, so they practice the orthodox system of medicine which is the conventional system of medicine and i don't think the doctors are um, aware of the system of homeopathy or they offer a choice to the patients hmm, that uh, there are other systems of uh, medicine which are available for the treatment of their cure so they they've got left with no choice but to go uh, for the mainstream treatment okay how is the situation corona is corona how is the situation corona right? corona it is all in the tvs in the on the on the radio, radio but if i look around so everything is normal for me yeah so we go Back out and everything is over right the vaccination and everything is over in uk right uh yeah the, it, it has been uh now it's the least kind of restrictions at the moment so the people they go out they get together they still there are some instructions about covering your uh, uh face and keeping a distance of 2 meter but uh, uh now i think they are uh, earlier i could see the institution the religious places so they were um, uh, not very much open to the pu- public now they are open so the even the on the wedding there was restriction of um, number 6 only now they have increased it to number 15 and 30 and there is no restriction of the number of participants where a funeral takes place so in other words it is being relaxed much more as compared to do you treat to, any corona patients do you treat uh, Uh, i have yeah i have treated in india as well as and in here as well but i don't treat them as patient of corona i treat them as a patient yeah so it, it the patient can have uh, symptoms like corona or like any other uh, illness which has been given a diagnostic label so i i keep the diagnostic level uh, apart and then i treat the patient uh as they come to me i treat the symptoms only okay. thank you doctor but, yeah Thanks. but I, i i have seen patients who have been uh tested positive and they have successfully uh cured as well great great thank you doctor thanks for your uh, nice presentation we are yeah. expecting your continuous part uh, continuous participation in our platform you and your friends continuous participation in our platform because we are looking for thank our you. Our, com- our uh, unique voice. That's it. Our unity is our strength. So we need more participants and all. Anyway, thank, thank you for your presentation, Doctor. And uh, we can go for the next participant uh, panelist, Doctor George Matthew from India. Uh, he is an associate professor in charge, uh, Department of Materia Medi- Materia Medica, uh, Nehru Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital, New Delhi. Uh, passed BHMS from uh, Trivandrum. That's in Kerala. In back in 1994 and uh, md in uh, calicut the other city in kerala in 2000 and first rank holder in upsc medical officer teaching selection is the first hold, uh, rank holder in 2002 joined in 2003 in nehru homeopathy medical college and hospital in new delhi uh, resource person of several resource person of several rotps and cmes conducted by ayush ayush is the department of india it's uh, ayurveda homeo and unani it's department of india for teachers of homeopathy college of medical officers uh, proving associate of for drug proving program conducted in nhmc and h under the ccrh ccrh is the body of india uh, 
several papers published and presented in national and international journals and conferences, co-author of uh, clinical characteristics and remedy profiles of patients with COVID-19. Great. We would like to hear more from that, Dr. A uh, uh, retrospective cohort study published online in February 2021 in homeopathy. Great. So uh, that's the first British journal, homeopathic journal, worldwide. Anyway, I would like to welcome Dr. Uh, George Matthew from India. So you can speak for the next 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I was introduced that I'm from Kerala, I'm very happy to be introduced, even though I have been working for the last uh, 17, 18 years in Delhi. Uh, I'm basically from Kerala and I'll be using uh, the Kerala model for explaining certain scopes of homeopathy. You're, in you're, different... you're, you're speaking from Kerala or from Delhi? No, no, I'm from Delhi. So now I'm from Delhi. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But you are so, teaching, your model is from Kerala still, right? Yeah, I'll use because extensively because Kerala is one of the places where you have homeopathy as a very organized, structural, government-funded uh, teaching methodology. So, so I'll but come to that later. Right now, right now, Kerala is the only... Uh, in all over the world, Kerala is number one right now. Am I right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. But, but, uh, but even, Italy, even, Kerala is not approved, right? Yeah, that is the sad part. Even when I'm taking my classes in uh, in college, I refer to extensively to Kerala where the, the scope of homeopathy has been explored to a great deal. So, first of all, I I have a yeah. question about that. Out of some yeah. sort of thing, because yeah. you're part of CCRS. Why CCRS is also not involved in? That type of things, especially the uh, the Supreme Court given the order to Kerala and the all things, but only Kerala is not allowed. In Kerala, there is one major issue. What I have understood is that in Kerala, because Ayush is controlling the whole thing, so the Ayush advisory is the basis for all these things. So in the Kerala, the Ayush secretary is a uh, is an allopathic doctor. So if you have an allopathic doctor at the helm of affairs for a homeopathic a system, it will be very difficult for things to get, get uh, even the, the policy makers and the stakeholders will not be able to move further for anything. That's why that, one, that's why that is one of the, that is one of the major things, but, but the people in Kerala have taken to homeopathy in a, in a big way. So even though there, there are a lot of resistance are there, even from IMA, from other others, there are a lot of resistances, but people have taken up homeopathy in a big way. So that's, that's why our, our, our topic is very important, right? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. definitely. Thank you. So I'm, so I'm very happy to uh, be a part of this discussion. Uh, so I'm uh, privileged to be a part of the discussion. And uh, I thank Dr. Shaji, uh, who had invited me for this presentation. So uh, the first important thing I would like to say about this topic is what needs to be done to make homeopathy the number one medicine. So first of all, we have to prove the efficacy of homeopathy globally in preventive and curative care. So we have two important spheres where we say healthcare is done. One is preventive care and one is curative care. So for this, we have to highlight the, the strengths or what we call the forte of homeopathy. The strengths of homeopathy have to be highlighted. So first of all, when you look, up, look at prevention of diseases, especially we have non-communicable diseases like uh, hypertension, diabetes, a lot of diseases are there which are rampant all over the world. So here, actually, what I feel is that there is a role of a family physician. A homeopath should be a family physician who can look at uh, the, the patients who are coming to him in different stages of life, different situations of life, different ages of life, and understand them. So because basically these uh, non-communicable diseases are due to, uh, like, or they are understood as lifestyle disorders. So there is a need of modification of these lifestyle disorders or preventing these lifestyle disorders to develop in the, uh, in the person. So here the, act, the, the role of a family physician is very important. I think long, long way back we had, we had people called family physicians, but now it's a very, very rare condition where we come across a family physician. So this has to be reinstated, I think, to make homeopathy more approachable to the people, especially in the control of uh, these lifestyle disorders. Okay. And the constitutional medicine, of course, has a great deal to deal with this lifestyle disorders management. And then now we come to the topic of epidemics or pandemics, which we are uh, facing now for the last two years. So again, if you look back at 
in 1918 when we had the Spanish flu, that is, more, we can say more in the pre-antibiotic era, we had these homeopathic treatment when it was compared to the conventional treatment, the mortality was 1.05% in homeopathy, whereas in allopathy it was 30%. So, but that is in the pre-antibiotic era. But now, nowadays, recently also we have a lot of, uh, this is in the treatment, uh, what I'm saying. And also we have, nowadays we have the uh, uh, preventive use of homeopathy in chikungunya, in Japanese encephalitis, in leptospirosis. So leptospirosis and all, like we can see uh, countries like Cuba taking to homeopathy in a big way. So like entire parts of Eastern Cuba have been given preventive medicine. So that, so these type of uh, activities have been going on along the, around the world. And in the past also, you can see for cholera, for yellow fever, for diphtheria, for typhoid, all these conditions homeopathy has been used extensively. So here the scope is in prevention of the disease when we have the, when we can work out the genus epidemicus and also for controlling the mortality if there is infection at all. So when you look at COVID-19, for example, we have a preventive protocol where we have arsenic 30, which has, which has shown to be like, we can see a lot of anecdotal evidences, but I think still large scale trials, double blind randomized control, control trials have yet to come out to, uh, like, uh, to substantiate our findings regarding arsenic. But even then we have a lot of anecdotal evidences are there in different states, especially in Kerala also, we have a lot of anecdotal evidences. Entire districts have got the evidence of uh, this uh, particular uh, preventive aspect of arsenic. And then the next, so one is prevention. The second one is management of the acute COVID infection where we have mild and moderate cases. So last year, so I'm working in an institution where we had last year, our center was the COVID healthcare designated center. So we were looking at mild and moderate cases, but again, because we have uh, policymakers and the health department is, uh, has certain guidelines. So we had to function along with allopathic medication, because the standard conventional treatment has to be given and then only along with that only homeopathy could be given. So that was one uh, difficulty which we had, but even then, wherever we could cut down on standard conventional care, we tried to cut down and give homeopathy and see. But again, that is difficult to say where homeopathy is, uh, how much effective, especially in mild cases. So mild and moderate, we had to tackle it. And now the most important thing, which is looming uh, in front of us is the post-COVID syndromes, especially the acute post-COVID condition and the chronic post-COVID condition. That is a lot of hundreds of patients are now like uh, queuing up with this com complaints. So there we have to see what homeopathy can do. I think there also, I think in Kerala, we have seen that the post-COVID treatment protocol has been approved by the government. Uh, and now they've already started in places, especially in Trivandrum and I think in Kollam also they have started clinics for this post-COVID management. Okay. So there is one important thing that is the policy making and funding. So these two things are very important for epidemic management when the epidemic, so especially, so I'm coming to referring to Kerala, where we have this REACH, the organization called REACH, which is a government-funded government, government funded organization started way back in 2005, which is called the Rapid Action Epidemic Control Cell. So this uh, studies cases, this uh, organization is funded by the government that studies cases, they uh, diagnose cases, they uh, repertorize the cases and they develop or they bring out the genus epidemicus, which is uh, distributed to the masses uh, so that the preventive aspect can be taken care of. So this is very important. So once the genus epidemicus is, find out, is found out, actually we have to, again, the, our duty does not finish there. So the main thing in homeopathy is that we don't have evidence-based medicine, or we don't have the, the publications to support our treatment. So we have a lot of cases, we have a lot of uh, experiences, but this has to be documented through RCTs and uh, publication of uh, our results, reproductive results, our research in uh, international peer-reviewed journals. So and epidemic cells, for example, in a college, if you're looking at one college, if I am looking at my college, I can say that there's a community medicine department. So that community medicine department can have a uh, epidemic cell, wherein there are people who are interested in this, they can coordinate the activities on the college level. And this can be taken up to the district level and later on uh, like collaboration with the state level. So that particular state can get the benefit of all the, the uh, technical know-how of the, uh, the, the doctors who are working in the homeopathic uh, colleges. So this is one thing we can do from the grassroots level to bring about this, uh, this uh, change in the epidemic control activities. And then one more thing is like, even, even when we are waiting for the government fund to come, we can have small 
level exploratory trials, small trials can be conducted wherein we can at least show some results which can uh, convince the government. So when I'm looking at one important project, uh, which, was in, uh, which was implemented in Kerala, that is the Chaitanya project, which is dealing with terminally ill patients, that is especially cancer patients. So there, one of my colleagues had worked on that uh, cancer cases extensively and the, the results were shown to the government. They got very much aware, they were, they were, they were very much convinced and now they have this uh, 10 crore hospital, exclusive government homeopathic hospital, I think maybe in the world itself in uh, Northern Kerala at Wandu. So that is catering to OPD and IPD patients for cancer. So this is something which we can generate in you know, like we have small scale trials, at least we can do and then show the results to the government, which will convince them to take this up for uh, higher uh, or large scale uh, intervention. Then when we look at uh, homeopathy, the scope of homeopathy, so I'm just uh, uh, elaborating on the scope. So allergic disorders like urticaria, allergic rhinitis, allergic bronchial asthma, hundreds of conditions are there which have allergy as the background. So we have homeopathy coming in as a superior mode of treatment. So we even, even our allopathy counterparts come to us for treatment when they have this allergic problems. Uh, we know that. And autoimmune disorders, autoimmune disorders like SLE, a lot of conditions, RA, we have treatment, uh, much superior treatment I think we can offer uh, to the patients coming with autoimmune disorders. So there also, and especially our no source, we are working wonders, you can say in this autoimmune disorders. Then surgical conditions. So when surgical conditions, where generally we say surgical conditions are left to surgery, but we see a lot of surgical conditions which are coming back after surgery uh, with recurrence. So like tumors, brain tumors, like uh, uh, cancers, like malignancies, like uh, calculi, like thyroid swellings, like fibroids. Recurrence is coming. So one, I have seen uh, calculi cases where eight times the patient has undergone operation. So then in the ninth, ninth time he is coming to a homeopathic doctor because he is not able to. He doesn't have anything in his pocket to go for a uh, for a next surgeon. So this is where we have surgical, seemingly surgical cases with recurrence. So these are places where we can definitely highlight homeopathy and uh, show the uh, results of homeopathy. Now I am coming to the what I will call the Kerala model, which can be. Uh, which can be understood by uh, especially the people from outside Kerala and outside India. So we have a lot of projects which are run by the Department of Homeopathy in Kerala. The first one I've already mentioned that is the reach for the epidemic control. Then and the second one is the what we call the Ayushman Bhava that is dealing with lifestyle disorders. So lifestyle disorders also I mentioned regarding the communicable, non-communicable disorders. So there we are incorporating yoga and naturopathy along with homeopathy, and we give counseling, stress management, diet and nutrition counseling, all these things are done uh, on intensive level for uh, tackling this lifestyle disorders, which are very much rampant in our uh, country. Then we have a project called Sita Lane, which is a gender-based project for the healthcare of women, it's exclusively women. So the mental, physical, social health of women. So whenever we are like, we are able to, I think, when homeopathy can be taken up to a, to a number one medicine, when we are able to tackle the social, emotional, and uh, physical issues of citizens around the world, then definitely it will become a number one uh, medicine. That is what I feel. So here in Sitalim, it is women who are, who are taken care of in the mental, physical, and social health is taken care of through the projects. Then we have another called uh, project called Sadgamaya, that is for mental and intellectual development in children for correction of behavioral disorders. So this is a very important thing which happens in adolescent period in children, behavioral disorders which in which homeopathy can have a big scope. And prevention of substance abuse. So there's another project is also there called Punarjani that is for de-addiction clinics. So de-addiction, substance abuse, prevention, alcoholism, alcoholism, withdrawal. So a lot of uh, things which are uh, disturbing the society. This is taken care of in Sadhgamaya. Then in Janani, this is one of the, I think, flagship projects of the Kerala model, we can say that is the mother and child, especially in infertility cases. There we have, we are able to have a phenomenal, uh, I think, uh, results in infertility where people, uh, even from outside Kerala have uh, coming to Kerala. Now we have almost all the districts. It started in Kannu, then they had in Trivandrum and they, uh, started in Code Code. Now, I think almost all the district hospitals are taking this up in a big way. So, infertility treatment is, you know, as you know, there's a lot of money involved. 
people even sell their uh, their houses or the property to go for infertility treatment because to have a child is most important for them. So this, especially cases of cases in the male and the female with problems in the male and the female after IVU and IVF have been done. These cases are showing phenomenal results. Then already I told you about Chedana where we have this, uh, the quality of life is improved in terminally ill patients like for stroke, for cancer, for spinal cord injuries. So this has, has OPDs and IPD, both are there for taking care of, especially in the cancer hospital, they have IPD facility also. There's a team which is looking after this cancer patient. It's not only the homeopathic doctor who prescribes the medicine, there's a team, whole team, which is looking after this cancer patient. So OPD and IPD. So that is for the pain and palliative care to improve the quality of life. So we are trying to improve the quality of life in terminally ill patients. So these are certain uh, projects which are run by the Kerala government, the Department of Homeopathy. So this can be, I think, emulated on a uh, different states of India and even which can be taken up on a global level if, if other countries uh, can take it up. Uh, this can be done, uh, uh, I think, on a higher level. And for a few things I want to just mention as remedial measures for, for, for improving homeopathy in, in, in our state, in our uh, uh, country that is homeopathic education has to improve. Most important thing is homeopathic education has to improve. improve. Homeopathic teaching has to improve. So especially UG teaching, undergraduate and postgraduate teaching. Now we have PhD also. So this teaching on different levels have to improve. The education imparted to the homeopath, homeopathic students has to improve. Homeopathic research has to come out in a big way because now this is the uh, time of evidence-based medicine. So publications have to come out where homeopathic results are uh, shared with practitioners, and then management, homeopathic management and treatment of conditions. This also has to improve. So for certain things we can do, that is for practice, improving practices, we have good clinical practices, guidelines are there, that this can be incorporated. For manufacturing of homeopathic drugs, there is uh, good manufacturing practices or what we call as GMP, that is also there. Even for reporting cases, we have some guidelines called the care guidelines, which is exclusively modified for homeopathy work called the home case care guidelines. So where we can report cases which have been successfully treated. So these things are things which can take homeopathy to the next level. And one more thing is like we know in our, we know, always we say that uh, the double blind the randomized control trial is only for allopathic treatment. I think now if you look at if people, I think if people here are looking at uh, National Institute of Homeopathy or uh, institutes in in uh, Calcutta, you can see a lot of institutes, there are publications coming in Journal of Complementary and Alternative Medicine and in PubMed publications where double-blind control trials have been conducted in homeopathy. So there we have to prescribe very specifically. The prescription has to be very, very controlled. So you cannot just prescribe any medicine which comes to your mind. You have to be very careful in your prescription and very specifically you have to, have to prescribe, but the, the double-blind randomized control trials are possible in homeopathy. That's what I could understand from many of the publications. And in other states, in other countries around the world, insurance coverage, that is a very important thing when people come for homeopathy treatment, insurance coverage has to be there. Then we have to, we have a major role in correcting media, like starting from our Wikipedia, which says homeopathy is a pseudoscience. Even the online uh, print media like The Wire, they don't believe in homeopathy. They say that homeopathy is like all the other uh, uh, like non-scientific systems. So there we can, we have to bring out the, the scientificity of homeopathy in a big way. What are the researchers going on in homeopathy? What is the latest concept of the drug action in homeopathy? So this, these are things which have to be uh, educated on the media level also to, for, because media have a, has a major role in dissipating knowledge about any system. So that is very important. So I'll just talk with one simple case one, because we normally we say emergency cases we don't manage in homeopathy. So this is one case which I treated of COVID, suspected COVID, because this is in interior Orissa in a village called Normandy, where the patient was uh, about 60 years old, uh, fever case, high fever, and with vomiting, a diabetic lady. So I gave arsenic on the presenting symptoms. And then I told my cousin sister who was running an NGO nearby to get hold of a pulse oximeter at least the next day so that I could get an idea regarding what was the status. The next day her pulse oximeter, uh, well, she got the pulse oximeter, it was uh, that is uh, 82. 
SPO2 was 82. So I just was thinking that we have to shift, but there's no hospital nearby. So the nearest hospital is around 60 kilometers away and in the villages, people won't go to the hospital. So I just told her to you repeat arsenic alb every half hourly and just tell me the next morning. Otherwise you have to, and the next morning, she said, this is a miracle. I've never seen this, her SPO2, the, the, the fever had gone, uh, she was walking around, her vomiting had gone and her SPO2 was now 95. So initially I also could not even uh, understand so much of deep action of our arsenic alb in a case because preliminary investigations could not be done, even her RT-PCR could not be done. Pulse oximeter reading was given the next, was taken the next day only. So it was a very difficult case to manage, but even then, this is a case which we would have said, who oh, should have been shifted to hospital and put on oxygen therapy and all, but just we, with our arsenic alb, we could save that patient. So we have to, um, we have to redefine the scope of homeopathy, I think. We have to take homeopathy to the next level and redefine the scope of homeopathy to understand how we can uh, incorporate the scope of homeopathy to take it to the first medicine in the world. This is what I would like to uh, share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Especially from the, the Kerala model, we really enjoyed that. We want to discuss more about in our topic after the uh, discussion time. So we can go for the next panelist. Uh, Dr. Jonah Kotri from USA. She's a doctor mainly in Oriental medicine. She had been ded uh, dedicated most of her life to treating all varieties of illness, holistically and metaphysically. She is multidimensional transmedium healer, chairman with patients across the world. She's a board certified doctor of oriental medicine in the state of new mexico and is certified by the isa national board of acupuncture she has an mba great she studied at the pacific academy of homeopathy in san francisco and she is a graduate of germishes dynamics a four-year certificate program for advanced homeopathy studies she has participated in homeopathy. She has participated in homeopathy proving. Dr. Koti interviewed you on National Public Radio was featured in Self Magazine, The Washington Post, and Harper's Index. Dr. Koti is able to pinpoint the hidden causes which rob a person of their health and vitality in turn. She corrects them using constitutional homeopathy, drainage homeopathy, nozodes, etc. Dr. Courtney lectures and teaches seminars internationally. She is the founder of Courtship, teaching and healing centers for the advancement of homeopathy. Great. Uh, uh, we would like to expect a very good speech from you, ma'am. Dr. Jonah Kote, you can discuss, ma'am. You can, that's your time starts now for the next 10 minutes. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Can you see me? No, ma'am. Your video is off. Um, I can't see you either. Um, let's you see. Yeah. Please switch on your video. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm on the phone. I'm on my phone and I'm, I don't see a video option. Ma'am, uh, there's a video option on the. Okay. Okay. There it is. I just pressed. Okay. Can you see me now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. Hello. Yes, yes. ma'am. Ma well, well. We can, we can see you. We can see you. Okay, good. Okay. So um, living in the state of, of New Mexico is very different than other states uh, in, in, the, in the USA. It's, it's not heavily populated and uh, it's a, actually it's a poorer state than most states. The interesting thing about New Mexico is that the doctors of oriental medicine organized a long time ago to promote acupuncture and homeopathy. And what 
they did, which was very, very effective, is that during the time of the legislature, they would go there and set up a clinic and treat people for free. And this way, the, the people in the government all received treatments over several years. They became very well aware of it, and they, they passed laws that helped holistic medicine. So we have the best laws protecting us and encouraging us and paying us with insurance than most states. So I'm telling you about this because I think it's very important that we reach out to government officials so that they get treated and they understand what it, what it is, because most people don't understand what this is. Um, I, I think it's a real important uh, action to take to promote homeopathy. And I want to thank all of you because you have you have given me such inspiration to become uh, active in this, in your goal of making homeopathy world known and uh, world used. So I think that um, another thing in the United States that was very difficult for us was that big pharma had passed laws that made us the enemy. And even 20 years ago, uh, MDs here in Santa Fe, they would get their doors kicked down for practicing homeopathy or holistic medicine. Now, over the last 20 years, it's evolved quite a bit. And so, but we still have this fear, you know, there's this, still this fear of hiding and keeping it, keeping it under the table. And so that's what I want to bring up now is making this more available to government officials, to educators and, and higher universities. Also putting together classes for even grade school children and for mothers. And this means creating more sustainability and and sustainability here would need the funding from nonprofit organizations. We have to have a strong base. And so I am starting a nonprofit organization which will be sustainable for teaching children, mothers, uh, schools. And everything's been on hold because of COVID, but I want to thank all of you. This is really inspiring to move forward because here in the States, we, we kind of are isolated from each other. You know, we, we don't really know about each other so much about other homeopaths about, and especially now since COVID, but even before COVID, you know, we did, we do have certain symposiums and um, for homeopaths, we have lectures, but it, it's not as organized as it is in India. And you know, I would really like to, to come to India to be an intern, to see how some of your programs work so we don't spend a lot of time reinventing the wheel and that we can use your knowledge and your efforts and your productivity to help us here. Another, you know, another, um, avenue to help expose homeopathy is through just something very easy and effective like acute cases when people are traveling. I always bring a homeopathic kit with me when I'm traveling. And a, a couple of years ago, I was in Argentina in Buenos Aires. And some of the people in my group were very ill uh, with the allergies and, and some kind of chemical that they were spraying in the hotel that got into the air systems. Anyways, I treated them and some of them were ready to go home. And after treating them, they all were very, very excited about homeopathy because then they didn't have to go home anymore. So it's this grassroots teaching here that I think is more effective 
in, in the States. And it's reaching the young. It's reaching, like I said, the children uh, and, and classrooms. So I was thinking about how important it would be to have interns, you know, just interns from one through uh, 12 graders or, or high school students to come in and sit and watch people get treated because then they, they have an idea that there's another way, another profession. I know that when I was in high school, we went, we had uh, symposiums for different kinds of healthcare practitioners. We never saw anything about homeopathy. So as someone else had, had mentioned, that would be a great thing to organize those kinds of teachings and those kinds of presentations. But I feel like here in the States, we need your help. You are so organized and you have so much experience in, in teaching larger amounts of people, uh, groups. And I think that in order to make this work better here, we, don't, we need to feel less isolated. We need to create an international community like you're doing here, which is just wonderful, to, to help homeopaths here in America uh, catch up to speed. Because we've, ha we've had to deal with the government here and, and Big Pharma, who pays off the government, who opposes everything we stand for, everything we know, and we just need a little support to help us move through this. And not saying that you have to do anything, but just by your example and showing us and giving us these ideas will really help motivate us so that we're not these little islands separate from each other. Because, you know, we're, we're, we're large. Each state has different laws. Um, you could be licensed in one state and not be licensed anywhere else. Even if you're uh, nationally licensed, you still have to get licensed in each state. So we're very isolated and it's very expensive to become licensed in, in various states. So um, I like the idea of creating, even if we did like one day classes in public schools or secondary schools or universities, even if we started to expose people slowly, it will give them a, an idea of there's other options. So how I came to know about homeopathy was that when I moved to Santa Fe, I studied with a homeopath who was 103. And she was a naturopath and she taught me basic homeopathy. And and those are the kinds of examples of people who are teaching that change your life. You, you see what's available. You see how, how powerful it is. And we all know how powerful it is. But what I'm saying is, is that teaching even individuals in a way that she taught me and she taught classes and she was very organized, uh, it, it helps promote homeopathy. And so we're, you know, we're, it's so different here in the United States. We're not, we're not organized like you are because of the laws that were preceded us. But those laws are changing and we're getting more involved. And um, I was just gonna take a look at my notes. Um, I think I wanna leave this with, it has to be sustainable because in the United States, we pay a lot of money for our education. And most healthcare practitioners, most doctors, chiropractors, doctors of oriental medicine, naturopaths, we have enormous student loans, enormous. And, uh, and so to, to do other things in addition to paying those loans off and supporting ourselves, it's a little harder to get involved in a bigger picture, but these kinds of talks here are giving me ideas. And I think that 
if we all work together and sharing our projects with each other, it will really promote us. It'll promote homeopathy. So um, that's what I have to offer. The legislation going into schools, even young, young uh, grade schools, high schools, colleges, giving one day presentations, just an exposure is a start. It has to be grassroots here because we've had so much opposition. But as, as we progress in these projects and we work together like this, uh, and you're giving me so many ideas about lifestyle and preventative uh, homeopathy, it, it doesn't, I mean, what, what I wanna say is it promotes us to use what we know and get us excited and passionate about teaching and, and bringing this out into the world. Thank you. 